So, hi everyone, good afternoon or good morning, whatever you are in the world. Thank you for coming today. Uh, we are going to be talking about On the Hands of the Unknowns, Unknowns by Adi Morin. Uh, but first of all, we want to thank, uh, we're going to be thanking the sponsors that they make this conference possible. So thank you, Adi, for joining us today. And um, we're going to be introducing you. And after that, uh, feel free to pop questions after her talk so we can uh, answer. Hi, Adi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Sure. OK, so whenever you're ready, you can start presenting and you can you can go ahead. Can you guys see my slides? Uh, oh, boy. I don't know if that worked. Sorry. Technical difficulty. Oh, my gosh. Recursion. OK, I'm good. Cool. Thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Addy. I work at uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs, uh, which is just kind of like Sandia, a national laboratory. It's based out of Richland, Washington. And I'm on the data visualization team and I do full stack. So anywhere between actually doing the visualizations to doing the data engineering that feeds the data visualizations. So this talk is really about how you can apply data visualization to cyber. Um, so without further ado. So I'm sure everyone's here. They know how much data actually gets stored. But before this talk, I didn't actually realize how much that actually was. So um, there was a study that was done that for about a thousand employee company, which I would think is you know fairly average, um, and with a standard IT setup, you know you've got laptops and maybe some smart printers, some scanners, um, servers, etc. So with just a basic setup, you store anywhere from three gigs to 113 gigs per day. Um, which is just insane. Um, and then going down, just to make things more complicated, <laughs> there's non-functional requ non requirements that make you save the log files from anywhere from one day to seven, or I'm sorry, one year to seven years. And that's usually a security requirement. Um, but on the low end, that's 1.1 terabytes. And on the high end, it's 41 per year. So let alone seven years later. That's just no, not possible to do by hand, which thankfully we don't actually really try. A lot of times the log files are actually never opened or seen um, unless something happens. So uh, moving on to like how cybers kind of work today or at least one section of it, and that's alert-based security. So we have Splunk and Logstash and a couple other, you know, pretty common applications where you set up rules and say, hey, if you see this activity, this is bad, or this could be bad and needs more investigation or something like that. And this works tremendously. So <laughs> problem though, is that you kind of need to know what you're looking for. Like you need to be able to say, this is what looks weird, or this is bad. And with cyber, I mean, I don't know who is interested in offensive, but there's the, the mentality that to be a good offensive cybersecurity engineer, you need to break into something once. To be a good defensive cybersecurity engineer, you need to defeat that attacker 100% of the time, which is a much harder job, especially because like I like offensive. You get to be creative and think in ways that nobody else has, which means that you probably don't know what rules to do because I'm trying to be creative. So super helpful for the things that you know about and what they can look like. Um, FireEye in 2020 said that only 9% of attacks actually triggered security alerts, which is really interesting. So moving on to threat hunting. Um, so threat hunting is more of a, a proactive approach to cybersecurity, where you kind of want to just experiment, see what's out there. You're trying to find patterns and and things that you probably couldn't just like look at. Um, there's the definition if you guys are interested. So I will tie back to threat hunting, but first data visualization. So Data visualization to me is kind of like art. It, you know, it tells a story to be good. Otherwise, it's kind of confusing. So one of my favorites, I'm a huge Star Wars junkie, so you'll see multiple Star Wars uh, visualizations. Sorry. So, you know, for, what, 12 hours of videos, um, <laughs> it's summarized in one chart, I think is pretty impressive. And you can kind of get a general idea about what the storyline is like. And so this is, a, in my opinion, fairly good data visualization. Here's another one. Um, where it's looking at how Stack Overflow traffic changed during the week of DEF CON in Las Vegas. 
which is really interesting because you can almost start figuring out what they talked about at that DEF CON conference without seeing the agenda or seeing anything about DEF CON except looking at what may have like been a result of DEF CON. Another one, so this one is really interesting. It's a 3D data visualization using, it's a Twitter toxicity chart. So it's basically saying as a feed, does the feed get toxic in like how people communicate with each other? Does it get mean or angry? And so it's, it's showing how different branches of conversation turns toxic. And again, so I guess I haven't said this yet, but it's not all about that, you know, if, if a bioengineer can look at a data visualization I created as a as a cybersecurity engineer or software engineer that they understand it or vice versa. It's about the person that cares about the data that they understand it. So I don't have a lot of experience with toxicity and like communication data. And so this chart isn't nearly as helpful for me as it could be to somebody else. But still, um, it's just kind of getting like that's got to be a lot of data stored in like one picture. So if you kind of understood what the data was like, visualizations like this can be very helpful. Another one, another avenue of data visualization that's kind of emerging is um, augmented and virtual reality data visualizations, um, which is just another way to view data that may be more intuitive. So there's data visualizations in kind of a nutshell, none of it cyber related necessarily. So I'm going to kind of deep dive into a cybersecurity data visualization, data visualization example, and then we can tie it all back together. So at the lab, we have a program called Pisces, and it's a, it's a program that ties students with, uh, how did they phrase it? Um, I wanna say it's kind of like, oh, communities, like government communities. So that could be places that maybe not have cybersecurity in their repertoire yet because it's a small company or a small program. And so basically it adds training to, software, to students and in doing so helps the company get some cyber information. And usually it kind of ties in where a student can get hired by that company now. So uh, it just looks at packet headers. We're trying to, you know, keep the community safe and not give too much information. So the students will only ever see packet information. Um, a little more about the data itself. The data I'm gonna be visualizing and showing you guys today is only about eight days worth of data, which was about 2.4 million records. And then something that's different from what I'm showing you versus what the students see is I change the IPs so that they're UUIDs, just again, to help um, protect the co communities. So the students actually see IPv4 and IPv6 packets though. So just so you know. All right, so I'm gonna start off with the things that worked and give the caveat that I've been a software engineer for six years and have, like specialized in data visualization for about the last year and a half. And I still am struggle blessing. So the things that work to start off with is to start small and improve as I go. Um, I, I actually had to spend lots of quality time making sure the data was good. Um, I started off with a small amount of data or a small time frame to get small amount of data. And then I, before I even really tried to start programming necessarily, I wrote down the things like the questions I was interested in. And I can show you examples at the end of the slides. So the things that didn't work, and again, that, so <laughs> the things that work weren't necessarily in order. So the first thing I tried to do was get the Q1 packets for 2021, which was, so if eight days was 2.4 million records, I wasted so much time trying to get all of the packet headers from for four months. Uh, I also wanted to do the coolest thing first, because that's just how I work, which is just terrible software engineering skills. Like I want to do something like this, like that is cool. I didn't want to do a bar graph or pie chart, like those are just kind of meh, helpful depending on the use case, but I didn't, I wanted to do something cool, which again, didn't work out very well for me. Also caveat, that is another Star Wars data visualization that shows all of the character connections. So you can kind of see there's lots of characters in Star Wars that are all interconnected very well. All right, moving on. So here are just some of the results. So this is kind of like a tree map where you can pick you know, five plus, you know, you can pick any number of fields that you're interested in and see the connection. So you can kind of see like there was no weekend data. Um, it was all basically flow, maybe a couple of stat points. You can see where most of the port information came from. And given this is not all of the data, this is just a subsection of data. Um, so, I mean, out of the 2.4 million records, this isn't all of it. 
So sometimes with data visualization, you could have the data, but you kind of need to scale the problem even more. Because again, like if I tried to view all 2.4 million records, this would be insane. I would guess off the cuff that this is probably showing, you know, 500,000 records, give or take, you know, some kind of aggregation. So it's still a lot of data, a lot of data that would be a pain to look at manually, or even doing Splunk alerts and things. So kind of see the connections here. You can do IP address. And again, these are UUIDs. These are actual IP addresses in the system, but source and then destination IPs. And so you can kind of see who talks to who and how they may be working. So hold on, let me let the video kind of go back. Um, Cause I want to show you, see that line right in the middle and I'm pointing at my screen, like you guys can see it. Um, like a like quarter of the way in, there's a line. That to me looks like a scanner because it talks to a lot of computers compared to others, um, you know, versus some of these only talk to one system. Like on the far right hand corner, upper right hand corner, there's just like one system that that, that system communicates with. Um, and then on the lower left, I do have um, some colors. And so the yellow through the purple are the ones that are a ton of data. So the blues, the blue color means that they didn't send that many and I can show you the scale. Um, but like the yellow, I think is in the hundred of thousands packet. So though that system talks to each other a lot. So, okay, there's the first diagram. All right, this is a similar one, but instead I scaled it, scaled the bubbles. So it's off of the size of the packet. So you can kind of see that even though some of them talk very infrequently, they send a lot of data. Um, then you can kind of see like my scanner idea or what I thought was kind of a scanner. I'm guessing here. I don't actually know. Um, they don't, they're not very big packets. So that could almost be just a, Hey, are you there? Kind of pings. Um, so again, you can kind of start building on these data visualizations once you kind of start seeing what they're all about. Um, and again, this is just kind of a fun one. Another one. So this one's in 3d, which I think is super helpful. Um, because you know how I pointed out in that lower left hand corner, you had to like really zoom in and see, you know, these are, you know, the ones that talked the most. And so I was wrong. It was over 300,000, um, IP counts, I'm sorry, packet counts for the eight days between those two IP addresses compared to the others. So I think there's only, you know, maybe five, five or 10 that talk to each other more than 25,000, give or take. Um, so sometimes if you just look at the data a little differently, even though that's the same data and the same kind of chart, but in 3D, it makes it much more intuitive. Because when you don't actually know what you're looking for, it can get kind of intimidating. All right, moving on. So a couple other ideas that have come up, and this is mostly to show you how I started this process and the questions I started to ask. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna skip a bullet. I should have put this in a different order, but like the questions I was asking is, I care about what's infrequent. You know, if I have rules and, and things that kind of say, I know this is bad. Um, but sometimes it's not always in the sense of one of the most common insider threat things is someone that works late or someone that works on the weekends. But that's not always true. I mean, there's always, I mean, like I work on the weekend kind of frequently um, or I work late because I, I live in a different time zone than the rest of my, my company. And so if they had a rule that says anybody that works past eight o'clock on my time zone is an insider threat or someone that needs to be investigated. But if I do that every day for four years, it's probably not, people probably don't care anymore. And so one thing that's really difficult about cyber as most of everyone knows is that it's very easy to get burnt out. There's a lot of information, a lot of things that are false positives. And so trying to keep up with the things that you care about when you don't actually know what you care about can be very difficult. And so if you're kind of trying to find the abnormalities in the data, when if you, you kind of have to understand the data and know what you're looking for, but also trying to figure out what you don't know and don't understand. Um, so looking at the, like the infrequency of when systems talk to each other, if they talk to each other once every nine months, it's probably kind of weird. It doesn't probably happen very often. Um, you know, or if someone, one system sent, you know, a 
huge, huge packet and it normally doesn't, that could be something that gets investigated, but that'd be really hard to write a rule for or a one that you don't get a lot of false positives for. Um, another idea I had, which isn't based off a question, it's just kind of like a fun uh, visualization for me is if you did a node graph, so like the circles and the nodes are the IP addresses and then the connection between the nodes was like either the count of the packet. So you could have a really big bar between two nodes to show that they talk to each other a lot. Um, you could also do the same idea with the average packet size. Um, you can kind of start getting a feel for what the system looks like without actually looking at any log files. You're just looking at the IP addresses and you know how, how often they communicate or, or what they normally communicate. So there's a couple other ideas. Caveat, um, like machine learning and AI, um, data visualization is only as good as the data you can you can give the data visualizations. If you have very like weird and confusing data, you probably won't get very useful data visualizations. So that is a very difficult part of data visualization is just kind of figuring out how much data do you need to make a lot of sense? Or are you getting too much data and you're missing things? And so just be, be careful. Um, and then just some getting started. So this is both from a company perspective and as an individual trying to learn about data visualization. So Brown University has a really cool interactive data visualization, like kind of class, but it's kind of like a, a, a page that you kind of just kind of go through. Um, and then the data viz project is something I use in my day to day job where it's kind of a, I have this kind of data, what information or what well, visualizations would be helpful for those. So like for me, before I started at my current job, I didn't know what a tree map was. And so, but that's specifically for correlating data. And so you can kind of see what other visualizations are meant for correlating data. And then for tools, what I showed you was all using uh, Plotly. And Plotly's got, I think Ruby, JavaScript and Python. I use Python. Um, Splunk, if you already use Splunk, uh, they have dashboards and they can do some really cool data visualizations as well. You don't get as much flexibility, but they're still very helpful, especially getting started. Um, and same thing with Kibana. Um, Matplotlib is a good Python tool uh, and D3 is really cool as well. Um, that's what I use in my day-to-day -day job as well. And that's um, JavaScript. I don't have much experience with Tableau, but that would be kind of fun um, trying to get a demo or something for. Uh, and I guess one thing I hadn't realized when I was getting into cyber was you can get individual versions of Splunk if you wanted to. So you wouldn't have to have it sitting as a server listening on your system. You could just kind of have it as a virtual machine and then you can add data to it and just kind of play with it as a student or just in, an individual. So um, there's some resources and then questions. And I guess I should happy to answer questions but I wanted to give you guys the references for all of the uh, diagrams and uh, sources and such. So, yeah. What questions do you have? Or not? Oh, oh, sorry, now I just see all the chats. Sorry about the stuttering. Cool, well, if you guys have any questions um, or if you want specific links, cause like I said, there is text. So, I mean, I, I can be happy to send those to you if you need them, so. I'm taking this as a good sign. I don't know. But well, thank you guys for the time. Okay. Thank you. Sure.